if change is going to come that's going to make students happy, then it's change that has to happen on the student level and the faculty level and the administrative level. Each of these stakeholders, they're being called upon to do different things. You're listening to the Happy Doc Student Podcast, a podcast dedicated to providing clarity to the often mysterious doctoral process. Do you feel like you're losing your mind? Let me and my guests show you how to put more joy in your journey and graduate with your sanity, health, and relationships intact. I'm your host, Dr. Heather Frederick, and this is episode 53. In this episode, I chat with Dr. Leonard Casuto. Lynn received his PhD from Harvard and is a professor of English at Fordham University. He writes the graduate advisor column for the Chronicle of Higher Education, where he shares his expertise and experience from having been on the graduate education front line for over a decade. In 2015, he published The Graduate School Mess, What Caused It and How We Can Fix It. More recently, he teamed up with Dr. Robert Weisbuck, publishing The New PhD, How to Build a Better Graduate Education. Now, if the graduate experience was a book, this episode focuses on a chapter that might be titled something like Traditional Students Pursuing PhDs. Now, I know I have a diverse audience, so if you're a non-traditional student or faculty supporting students that are pursuing applied degrees like the EDD, DBA, PsyD, or DNP, I promise you that this episode is going to deliver insights and wisdom that will inspire more joy in any doctoral journey, especially the advice that Lynn gives to doctoral students near the end of the show. All right, without further ado, let's jump into today's episode. Lynn, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So given that this is the Happy Doc Student Podcast, I'd like to begin with a bold statement that I've heard you make that may come as a surprise to some of our listeners. And that statement is, we are teaching students to be unhappy. Yes, yeah, so I thought that that's where you might go. And it's a provocative statement, but it is in, in no sense untrue. And the logic behind it is simple. If you prepare people for jobs that aren't out there and teach those people to want those jobs above all other jobs and to feel like failures if they don't get those jobs, and I'm talking, of course, about tenure track professorships, then you're teaching people to be unhappy, which is practically the worst thing that a teacher can do. So it's remarkable that academics as a group of professionals who are well-intentioned and generally, if not selfless, certainly generous, it's remarkable that a group of people who are trying to do the right thing can fall so readily into a, a set of behaviors that arguably cross the line from unethical into immoral. How is it that we can invite talented young people to go to graduate school in the arts and sciences in particular, where this takes place, and then shape their desires as role models will do. So there's nothing wrong with shaping people's desires. We have to recognize that any good teacher is going to do that, but to shape people's desires so that they want something that they aren't going to be able to get and thus be unhappy with the time that they've committed and the place that they find themselves. It's incredible, but you, or you, we could say it's incredible, but maybe it's not so incredible because there is so much about the graduate school enterprise, or we might say the graduate school industrial complex that is unexamined by all of the stakeholders who are within it. And I have heard you talk about this with a very elegant number sentence that goes eight, four, two, one. Yes. The new book that Bob Weisbuck and I have just published from Johns Hopkins University Press, it's called The New PhD, How to Build a Better Graduate Education. And its opening riff is the 8421. And it goes like this. Imagine eight PhD students sitting around a seminar table. They are a first year entering cohort in 
your discipline's name here. And they are eager to begin their graduate educations. Well, let's take an aerial view of them. The first thing that we should notice about those eight students is that statistics tell us that four of them aren't even going to finish the PhD. That is to say a 50% attrition rate, five zero, which ought to be a wake up call to any workplace that half of the people who are aiming to get it won't. It's, it's remarkable enough that it's not a wake up call within academia, even yet more remarkable that most academics whom I speak to don't even know about it. And even more remarkable is that that 50% figure is actually lower than it was 50 years ago. And so all of those things together ought to make us remark upon this fact that four out of those eight who will leave, two of them will leave early, roughly speaking, which is in many ways a desirable outcome because graduate school is not for everybody. And there is an, an ideal attrition rate for graduate school that ought not to be zero. And the people who realize that it's not for them should realize it soon and be able to make a clean exit and, um, and go off and find their bliss elsewhere. Roughly two out of those four will do that. But the other two are going to leave later in their programs after blood and treasure have both been expended and the kind of, of profound unhappiness that can accompany somebody deciding that a PhD is part of who they want to be and then for whatever reasons having to leave, that is an ethical failure on the part of graduate programs because late stage attrition ought to be highly exceptional. Instead, it's common. So that is one of the many imperatives that face the graduate school enterprise to do something about late stage attrition. So we've got four out of eight who are going to leave academia, leaving four who will stay and finish. If we look at those four who will stay, approximately half of those, if we use pre-COVID numbers, we don't have post-COVID numbers yet, but they're not gonna look good. Two out of the remaining four are going to wind up in jobs outside of academia. That is, they will leave academia as well, but after they get their degrees. Leaving two who will get the kind of full-time teaching job that they were aiming for when they entered graduate school, except that it's not likely these days for it to be a tenure track professorship because those have been reducing in number even before the pandemic hit. And right now with academia reeling from the pandemic, the number of tenure track openings in the arts and sciences is disturbingly low. Before the pandemic, we could say that two out of those four were going to get some kind of full-time teaching job that would fulfill in some sense the aspiration that most of those eight original people brought to that table in the beginning. Out of those two, one or less than one is going to wind up at a job that resembles the job that the teacher who is going to enter that seminar room and teach those eight people has. That is one or less than one person is going to become a professor at a research intensive university that resembles the kind of place that trains all graduate students in the first place. Now let's return to that group of eight people who are sitting around the seminar table. They're all going to go through a PhD curriculum and that curriculum is going to be geared to meet the needs of that one person who goes on to the research intensive job. The fact that 75% of those eight people, six out of eight, will not wind up in academia at all suggests a profound disjunction between the aspirations of the students on the one hand, their likely outcomes on the other, and on the third hand, the curriculum that professors in their graduate program have collectively designed to meet what are assumed to be their needs, but which any reasonable portrayal of those needs is going to suggest is insufficient. 
So the statistics paint a somewhat bleak picture here. And when we talk about reform, one of the things that you'll say is, I'm not trying to convince people to not go to graduate school. What I want to do is have people open their eyes to what the reality of the current situation is. Absolutely. I am not one of those people who are saying, don't go. I am one of those people and I hope that we are increasing in number who are saying, if, if this is where your bliss leads you, you should go, but you should go with your eyes wide open. You should go if you receive sufficient support, not simply financial, but also professional from the graduate program that you choose that will enable you to go through graduate school with a realistic assessment of what it is that you're facing at the end that you can continue to aspire for a professorship because there will be some, some people will get them, but there needs to be a realistic view of what the likely outcomes are and a curriculum that is designed to prepare students for diverse outcomes and a faculty that is well aware of the need to keep that curriculum current and able to meet the needs of students. And in the process, honor the diverse outcomes that these students will attain, and in the process, not teach them to value only the professor's outcome and to feel that they've somehow not made the grade if they don't become a professor. Let me give a, a brief, but I, I hope telling example of what I'm talking about here. If you go on the web and you look for academic genealogies, if you just Google uh, academic genealogies, you'll turn up a lot of family trees of advisors and uh, advisors, and these are their students, and these are their students' students, and so on, which trace, in some cases, some quite venerable lines that go back to the early 20th century, where you have academic lineages of famous professors begetting other famous professors. In this lineage, I can say that I'm the grandson of Perry Miller, who was the great scholar of the American Puritans, who virtually invented the American Puritans as a field of study for literature people. This sort of genealogical thinking is quite common in academia and in some disciplines, it's rife. But let's consider that metaphor because the uh, genealogy is after all a metaphor. It's a metaphor of descent and connection. And these academic family trees silently erase anybody who doesn't become a professor. And yet, if you go through graduate school in many disciplines, you will encounter these family trees. They are an example of how we faculty members subtly and in ways that we're not even always aware of discourage students from considering the kinds of outcomes that they are likely to face. We encourage them to think of their success as being bound up in membership in the academy, that if you can get on the family tree, then, then you're a success, not otherwise. We have to examine our professional practices, not so that we can quit doing all of these things, but rather so that we can make practices like that conform to the reality that we and our students live in right now. So let's unpack this faculty resistance, which may be conscious or unconscious. I remember being back in undergrad, I was a first generation college student and my undergraduate mentor was very important. I don't think I would have attended graduate school had it not been for her. And I remember writing my statement of purpose for my applications and really putting in there what I thought I wanted to do with my life and her saying, oh wait, no, no, no. You, you need to say you wanna teach and do research at an academic setting. Even though I wasn't completely convinced that's what I wanted to do, I was told this is what you need to say you want to do if you want to play the game. Yes, this is an example of how admissions embeds so many of these assumptions. I wrote about this in a book that I published in 2015 called The Graduate School Mess, that the ways in which admissions embeds the assumptions of the faculty in the admissions process. And when we set up the admissions gauntlet, for students to go through, we are socializing them even before they enter into the pre-professional path that graduate school actually is. Because graduate school is many things. It's pre-professional. 
the question of what professions it is pre is something that we ought to be examining a lot more closely than we do. But the, the personal statement, theoretically, students can write anything they like in that personal statement. But in practice, what happens is much more like what happened with your undergraduate mentor and you. Your undergraduate mentor gave you a bit of what we call the hidden curriculum, the very popular phrase these days. The hidden curriculum is, oh yeah, you can say whatever you want, but what you really need to do is present yourself as a professor in embryo because then you will be conforming to the expectations of the people who will be reading your applications. If you wanna be an, an activist, oh, don't say that. Say that you wanna be a professor. You wanna develop curriculum for K through 12? Oh, certainly don't say that. K through 12, we pretend that K through 12 doesn't even exist because after all, they're our main supplier. It's really very hard to find an industry that is more indifferent to its main supplier than academia is. So back to this admissions, you, okay, you, you need to present yourself as a baby professor. And if you're accepted, you're going to come in with the expectation, oh, well, I, I rang that bell and I was admitted through the door. So therefore, I should keep doing that. And that is, in fact, what happens because the process of socialization picks up seamlessly from that point. So today, there are plenty of professors who embrace what we are calling career diversity. They embrace it because they recognize the realities that I've been speaking of. But they aren't looking at their own practice, including the practice of admissions. If we really believe in career diversity, we ought to be renovating the admissions process so that it reflects that commitment. And yet, the number of graduate programs in the arts and sciences that have done anything like that is currently minimal. And in fact, the agitation to do it is barely on the radar right now. It's, it's happening. It has happened. It's one of the salutary developments of the past even five years. But there are ways that the, the admissions process ought to embarrass us because of the ways that it enshrines a set of assumptions that are utterly inappropriate to the reality that we occupy right now. And they were appropriate way back when. In your books, you cover the historical context, but we don't live in those days anymore, right? I know that you graduated in the 80s. I graduated in the 90s. Jobs were becoming farther and further between at that time. And here we are in 2020, still doing the same things that we've been doing for hundreds of years. The market actually began to contract beginning in the 1970s. And so what we call a job market crisis has been going on for something like 50 years, 50 years. And still we're calling it a crisis. It's not a crisis. The crisis is that we can't wake up to the fact that the new normal, it's not only here, it arrived many years ago. There's a historical reason for this, and I pause to say that all of my work in higher education is perched on the postulate that we can understand the problems that we have in the present and, we hope, confront them and solve them if we understand better where they came from. And so the work that I've been doing in the graduate school mess and more, more recently in the new PhD is dedicated to try and uncover the decisions and the assumptions that have accompanied the decisions that have gotten us to where we are. If we're going to reform, we need to know what we did to get to the place we are. Not everything is a mistake, by the way. A decision that you make in a different set of time and circumstances is not a mistake if it doesn't work now. The mistake is not changing it now. And what happened roughly is that in the post-World War II era, the government began to invest in academia in a way that it never had before. It made academia its research and development lab, starting you know, with the STEM fields primarily because of the uh, different races with the Soviet Union, the arms race, the space race, and other Cold War developments. So the government began investing heavily in universities, both on the research end and also on the student end. That is, the government began subsidizing students 
to go to college, to encourage them to go to college. And college became a realistic hope for large segments of the population that had never before been able to consider going to college. So higher education became